honor for us to be part of this exhibition in such an integrated way, and it's really beautiful for me as a performing artist to feel the performing arts really brought into their context alongside visual arts, which is so much the way that we perform in Bali with beautiful carvings in the temple or with paintings in the temple or in our home. So it's really nice to kind of be in this environment and to be working in performing arts. So um, you may or may not know Gamelan Skarda is a group that's based in Berkeley. We specialize in the performing arts of Bali, which of course is a very small island in Indonesia. So what I think we're going to do is just spend a few minutes giving you a little bit of basic introduction to Bali and to Bali's performing arts and also a little bit about how Ramayana is seen and used, for lack of a better word, in, in Bali. It's quite different from India, the relationship that Balinese have with Hinduism um, and with these epics is, is quite distinct from that of those of our Indian counterparts. So it's really interesting to see, and I think Forrest made a really good kind of point of how distinct these different forms are. And of course, the exhibition, you can see that, but I'll talk a little bit about that also. So just to give you some background on, um, oh, I want to introduce Dode, who's Dewa and my son. He's an eighth grader at Albany Middle School, and Ayu, his big sister, she's at Albany High School. They're going to help us with the workshop portion, um, and they're great musicians and dancers. And so we wanted to bring in our own personal youth. Um, and then they get to see the exhibition, too, because it's actually really, a really special thing for us to be able to see these objects, because in Indonesia, we wouldn't have access to them. So it's, it's a wonderful gift that the museum has given to us, too. So um, Indonesia, just to speak a little more generally for a second, of course, is a very large Muslim country. It's the largest Muslim country in the world. And um, the vast, I think, I think it's about 97% of Indonesians are Muslim. And 1.7% of Indonesians are Hindu. And most of those Hindus live on the island of Bali. Some of them live in East Java, but really Bali is kind of the, the very small center of Indonesian Hinduism. But the Islam in Indonesia is quite interesting because it comes on a layer of animism and Buddhism and Hinduism. And Islam came in quite a bit later historically. And so it's a very distinct kind of Islam. And so I feel really especially at this point in our political history. It's important to say that because I think all of us know that, but as an Indonesian, I feel that every opportunity I have to say that, I, I want to say that because it's a really very special kind of Islam and a special relationship that um, Islam and Hinduism and Christianity and Buddhism have with one another in this country because they're really kind of layered one on top of the other. And it does take a little bit of effort to live together, but it seems to work out pretty well. So a lot of... Um, the Balinese practice Balinese Hinduism, which is very distinct from Indian Hinduism, the ancestor worship and animism that was part of indigenous Balinese spirituality before Hinduism arrived is still very much present. So a lot of the ceremonies you see in Bali are different, <coughs> both in their focus um, and their intention as well as in their practice. So Balinese are into these very big, ornate, offerings uh, and a lot of performing arts and the casts are often able to able to intermingle more freely particularly with regard to marriage um, than in, in India so it's quite distinct um, and as such the relationship with uh, epics such as the Ramayana and the Mahabharata are also a little bit different um, so let me turn so with regard to something like the Ramayana and Mahabharata often are spoken of together in, in Bali, and we have a lot of indigenous stories that are Southeast Asian stories or that are Balinese legends, that are local legends. So those are also very important spiritual um, kind of tales that teach us things, the value of philosophy of the people in Bali. So the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, the Pandi stories, the Baba, all of these are um, epics and tales that inform Balinese as they're growing up and as we're adults trying to make decisions about what we're going to do in life. So it is a very important source of story, very important source of philosophy, but it is seldom seen as in the same kind of religious intensity as it is in India. It's, it's, in, it's kind of embraced as part of our culture and part of our folklore and part of our performing arts, but it, people very seldom get into very heated arguments about it. People will have different interpretations, 
But in India, people can get really angry and very upset about different interpretations of the Ramayana. So it's a little bit more relaxed in the way it's used. And in, in um, Indonesia, you would see it in Central Java or in Bali and some other places also. But um, those are the two places that you saw a lot of artwork from those two areas just earlier in the, in the galleries. Um, but in, in Bali, we have, I mean, going back to this Balinese Hinduism thing, there was a, many years ago there was the beginning of different sects. So there were like Vishnu sects and Shiva sects and Hanuman and all of this, and that was creating a lot of strife because people were disagreeing about how they were going to practice Hinduism. So what was that like? So there was a meeting, people began to see this happening. So the spiritual leaders gathered at this very important temple, which is about 15 minutes from uh, was home, and they talked about what they should do. And what they decided to do was they required everyone to honor Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. And everyone had in their village a temple to each of these gods, and everyone in the village is required to treat them equally. And in that way, people were not allowed to hold up one god or one practice that was more important than another. It really helped reduce the divisions in Balinese Hindu practice. And it served us pretty well, but that then also means that you won't see so many shrines to Rama, or um, it's not treated in exactly the same way, because you have to also have the Shiva and the Brahma there along with Vishnu, um, which is Rama's. That's how Vishnu came to, to the earth was as Rama. There is, however, one shrine. I just want to share a little anecdote, which is that, um, you know, there's kind of the theory and kind of, I don't know, I don't know, I, I guess it's the theory of religious practice. But then there are also things that happen. So we did um, this Ketcha. They did a wonderful production of the birth of Ketcha just this last summer. And um, we, so Dewa made some great music, and it came from like Balinese life, and then developed into the use of Ketcha as. Uh, an accompaniment for sanyang, which is when spirits come into the body of young people and then those people go into trance and they dance. And so Ketcha is sometimes used to accompany that as a healing kind of activity for the whole community to come together. So Dewa did a piece that was inspired by that and partway through the piece we're like, something is wrong. And so there were some problems that happened and the performance <coughs> itself went very smoothly but we found out that later that night and the next day that we had not given an offering at two very important places. And one of those places was a temple and one of them was a shrine for Hanuman. And it was the first time I had ever seen a shrine to Hanuman in Bali. And it wasn't a big temple that was celebrated and no one actually knows about it. It's just one shrine inside of someone's family temple, actually. So we had to go to someone's home and then go inside their family temple. And inside that family temple, there's a shrine to Hanuman. And I don't really know the history of that, but it's quite unusual to see a shrine like that in Bali. But it's very powerful. And so you can't just go around and do things randomly. You have to still stay connected to these powers. So even though I say that there are not like a lot of, there's not a lot of Rama <coughs> worship and Hanuman worship, as you might see in India, there are these very powerful centers of spirituality in Bali which are very much connected to people's everyday lives. So just in June or July we did this project and the thing could not happen until we did these offerings at this very small shrine. So sometimes it's not about how big or beautiful or well known a shrine is, it's just about some kind of spiritual power that resides there. So I just wanted to share that because that was a new experience that I had with Hanuman and our own kind of artistic work. Um, okay, so you might see the Ramayana, of course you saw some shadow puppets, that's a very important form. There's a form of dance drama called Wayang Wong, where all of the characters are wearing masks. So you have a Hanuman mask, Subali and Sugriwa, who are two warring brothers, who you don't see too much in the exhibition, but Sugriwa becomes an ally of, of um, Rama in his journey, and Hanuman and Rama and all of these guys, are, but it's all mask dance. You would also see it in Semrakari, which is dance drama, where the dancers are wearing makeup and in full costume. The dancers don't speak in that particular type of drama. So you have Wayang Kulit shadow puppet, like you've seen here. You have a masked dance drama. You have an unmasked dance drama. What else do we have? You have Ketcha, 
which is the way we're going to see it today. Um, and of course, there is a lot of painting that you see um, talking about stories from the Ramayana. And also another thing that Deva was saying when he was talking about Balinese and how they see the Ramayana, he was saying Balinese are more likely to accept the ideal heroism of Rama, <coughs> the beauty and heroism of, of Sita and, and Hanuman, and accept Ravana as a kind of a demon king. And in central Java, which is the next island over, where they really pride themselves on being very intellectual, they're more likely to debate as um, Forrest was mentioning, sometimes you have a different angle on the story. So they might say, well, wait a minute. What about Rahwana's um, cousin? Like, maybe that wasn't really a good decision. Or maybe he should have been more loyal to his country. And why did he make that decision? So in some areas of Indonesia, there's a lot of discussion about why certain characters made certain decisions. Why did some of Rahwana's family decide to stay with him, even though they knew he was doing something wrong? Why did some of his family decide to join Rama's side? Isn't that being a traitor to your country? Isn't that being disloyal to your family? So who made the right decision in this particular context? So those conversations are really interesting, um, but they're less likely to happen in Bali, where people have a much more loose relationship and are very much, um, very much love the ideals that are embodied in these different characters. And we were talking earlier, because we I was looking at the Child by Fire paintings, and we're like, oh my gosh, that's so terrible. And then we were realizing that that scene actually is kind of seldom performed in Bali. So people know that it's there, but often they'll talk, there'll, there'll be a scene of the abduction of Sita, Rahwana transforming himself into a sage and tricking her. Or there's the golden deer, which is a beautiful scene because it's this beautiful kind of magical image. Um, and Balinese love trickery, transformation, and magic. That's like something Balinese are really into. Um, or the great battle of Hanuman and all the monkeys, like they love mass productions with like hundreds of people being monkeys on stage, but the question of the trial by fire, that is something that sometimes is not <coughs> performed and it's not really highlighted, so they and I were saying, I think Balinese are not, that's not something that resonates so deeply with Balinese, that particular point in the epic is something that's kind of like, oh, well, we'll just go into the next scene, or oh, well, we'll just stop just before that, so it's interesting how the choices that people make in, in the scene or the section of the Ramayana that they choose to perform or choose to retell really indicates a lot about the values of that individual as well as of that particular cultural group. So I found that kind of interesting because I do think that Balinese, even though it's a like patrilineal society and patrilocal society, um, is still very Southeast Asian in its interpretation of that. And the idea of the woman being like put through, in addition to having this whole scene of like being in Ravana's palace all this time, then also being put through this trial by fire is something that is not most Balinese people's favorite section of the Ramayana. So it doesn't get told quite, quite as often as other sections. Um, we wanted to show you some movement characters so that you can see how these characters you saw in visual might look in movement. So maybe we can have, I don't know, could you start with some Hanuman movement? So when we're doing movement for Balinese dance, things that indicate character are, are the use of the feet, the positioning of the hands, the movement of the body and the head. So you can, this is what Hanuman might look like. Mm -hmm. So you can see his fingers are kind of outward. This is a kind of an animal position for the fingers. Of course, he jumps around, he's very active and very respectful at the same time, which is why he keeps his body low sometimes. And he can fly because he's the son of the god of the wind. So that's Hanuman. And then um, I will show you some movement that Rama might do, and then Ayu and I will show you some movement that Sita and the Golden Deer might do together. So Rama is a little different from Hanuman, he's more upright. And it's not uncommon for a woman to portray this character, actually. And he tends to move more slowly. He can be a little assertive sometimes, or he can be sad and concerned about something. And he's also very brave when it comes to fighting in the battle. 
He's fearless and powerful also. So that's something that Rama might do. Um, Sita's character moves more slowly, and then maybe Ayu can join me if it goes into here. So Sita, female characters in general, are a little bit lower to the ground, move more slowly. Some of these movements are the same, but they're done in a more fluid style. So when she's sad, she's often like this in Ramana's kingdom. Sometimes she gets angry at him too if he gets too close to her. And then earlier, when she's in the forest, the golden deer comes. And the golden deer, remember, is a magical demon, actually, in disguise. She's not really a golden deer. She's a Ramana's uncle. But he's transformed himself into this very beautiful, magical being. who Sita really is interested in and really wants to grasp. And then of course this is what creates the whole problem. Because Sita wants the deer, she can't get the deer, and then she asks her husband, Rama, to go get the deer, <coughs> who disappears, and then Rama leaves Sita, leaving her vulnerable to Ravana approaching and stealing her. So that's how you might see, thank you, honey. the golden deer with glasses on. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the golden deer often is danced by a younger dancer, just because all that jumping around is something we stop doing after the age of certain age, which we won't mention. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but we were talking about the character of the Golden Gate earlier, and it is there's so much magical transformation in this story, which is um, one of the most beautiful for, things for me as a choreographer and as a dancer. I love all of those, the magical, like this big, ugly Raksasa turning himself into this magical, beautiful deer. And it's, it's, sometimes I think about it, it's like, is that about our materialism? Is it Because it's a golden deer, right? So is it about us wanting something that we really shouldn't be wanting too much? Or is it because yes. this demon is so powerful that he transcends the material world? And is it something spiritual that we're searching for? There's cer certainly this element of, of something that we're searching for. And often when we want something too much, like we treat keep giving it and finally we're like, okay, you go get that for me. And sometimes that can create a problem. Sometimes that becomes the beginning of a, of a much larger problem. So that little section always makes me think, what does that deer represent? And Balani love transformation of something horrible and ugly into something very beautiful and then transforming back into that horrible thing. Because when he's shot by when the deer is shot by Rama, he turns back into himself. <coughs> and Rama goes, Oh my God, what did I do? Why am I here? And then he goes running back, but by that time, Sita's gone. Um, and also, Rahwan, of course, transforms himself into the old man, too. Um, and Hanuman can fly. So there are all these really wonderful, magical things in the story that, for a performing artist, are so beautiful. Like, Dewa was flying, and Rahwan also can fly. So for dancers, this movement of like flying, like, when you, how do you? portray someone flying, you, you're looking down at them and seeing them from above, and Hanuman, and Rawana, and Jatayu, the Garuda, or the Eagle, all have these beautiful movements in performing arts when you're on the ground, but you're portraying yourself lifting up above and seeing the world from high above. So anyway, it's a really wonderful story for performers, because there's so many different characters, and there are different sections. If you decide to take just the section of the golden deer, it's so cool and interesting. If you just want to take Hanuman, he's such a cool <coughs> character in movement as well as in philosophy. Um, and Rama and Sita, of course, are really challenging as a, as a dancer because they're very understated. So how do you 
conveys someone who's very powerful, as a warrior who's powerful and brave but very wise. And how do you convey a woman who's very beautiful and delicate and at the same time, like how could she possibly have kept Ravana off for that long if she weren't also very powerful herself? So how do you convey those layers of complexity of, of who we can be as human beings in music and in dance and in song text? So this is one of the things that we love to do in performing arts and why it's so rich. So we're going to go ahead and have you learn some kecha. And um, kecha is sometimes called the monkey chant. It actually came from a form called cha, which was done as a healing form of music, as I mentioned earlier, for Japan. So the use of it to tell the Ramayana story is something much more recent than <coughs> within the last hundred years or so, which um, on the one hand means it's not the original, like quote unquote, authentic context of it, but on the other hand shows how performing artists and communities and people are always looking for new ways to tell stories that they love. And this one is really nice because you don't need instruments, you can have 20 of your students, you can have it be for adults, you can have it be for kids, or you know, whatever. But as a teacher, I find, um, you know, if you're thinking of teaching this to your class, there are a lot of things about it that are really important for all of us, especially for students, the idea of listening, of working in teams, of being responsible for your part, and someone else is doing something different and complementary to you, so we're not always doing the same thing, um, but that we're responsible for our part so that they can do their part well. Being able to do an activity while you're listening for a cue, later that will be Patewa. Um, but the idea of creating something together as a, as a community is really at the core of what Balinese performing arts are in general, but especially Keta. Because you don't have to have a certain body type, like for Balinese dance, I would have trouble doing Kanumat or the Kijang, just because I'm like this. Um, so, catch up, you can be any age, any body type, any face shape, it doesn't matter. Um, but we can all contribute to this kind of musical thing that we're doing together. So the idea of partnership and community is a really important one for this form. So maybe we'll start by doing, can we just show them the really simple version we do with the kids and then we'll show the chat to them too. Do we want to demonstrate first? Let me demonstrate. So we'll just show you what it sounds like, but it'll sound so much better when we're all doing it together. <laughs> okay, so can we start? See you. Jump, 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 jump,
Okay, so that's the basic pattern, but if you guys were all third graders, we would start with you guys going like this. So let's just try to stretch out because even girls like to stretch. And then they would stretch down to uh, just because sometimes fifth graders, sixth graders especially, are very like don't want to move. And then you come back up. Good. Okay, so maybe you can show them the hand. So we worked with some deaf and hard of hearing students at John Muir, which was an amazing experience. I have to say, I learned a lot because up until that point, I was very, I don't know, dumb. I don't know how I thought this. But I always had associated rhythm with hearing. And of course, it doesn't have anything to do with hearing at all, which we learned. It's the first two minutes of working with these kids. So in order for that to work, um, Doe added some hand movements. So maybe you can show them how the hand movements go with those same patterns. <coughs> with all kids, whether or not they're hearing kids, it actually works perfectly well with everybody. It makes it a lot easier for the kids to get into it. So. Yeah. Well, the keeper, see, boom, 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 see. Everyone will have the seer together, the gong, see. Everyone has that at the same time. Chuck, 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 chuck. 
Subdivision bit, Chak, 
Chaki 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 So opposite here K Chaki 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 When when you get it about don't use the K the word So mean Chak 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 Because when when we very fast so you can can say the K one Chak 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 too much. So when very slow to to lock your mind, you can use the cha ke cha ke cha ke cha ke cha ke cha ke cha here ke cha ke cha ke cha ke cha ke cha ke cha ke. You have ke on gong. You have cha on gong. Right. Same same pattern. Yeah. But the actual syllable is the cha, right? And the ke is just a holding for you. It's your crutch for now. So if you, want to, if you want to drop the K, feel free to drop the K, but you can't drop the cha. That's like the, yeah, that's yeah. the actual thing you have to say. Yeah, you, you, you know, is it uh, sweet? Do you guys want to switch or you want to try that again? Because we have the, the third one. We have oh, the third one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can do it. Okay. Feel the the on beat, off beat, between on beat and off beat. <laughs> 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 you have three three things. So if if that yeah if that lock is I mean like there is a the hardest you to keep you out on pattern. That's the harder. But the beauty is there also when you keep your pattern you can hear. Two of them, this make you laugh, and the beauty is there. The heart is there, the beauty is there. Yeah. Okay, uh, maybe you just try the, the third one after that, what, what we want. Yeah, let them do that. So it will be fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See. Well, let, let's say that, do we call Sang Lok? Sang Lok. Sang Lok. Polos. Sang Se. And sang lo. Sang lo. Let's say that. Okay. Yeah. So everyone together. Sang lo. Sang lo. Everyone. Yeah. Si. Tung. 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 Si. So I I use kecak ya. Use what? Kecak. 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 Very easy, very easy, we go like that, 
after we all go like one because that that I mean be stubborn now. <laughs> okay, let's try, let's try. Yeah. <laughs> so you have the gong. After the gong, 
what did this after John C. B. Sir Chaki, Sir Chak, that is run. So if God by number one two three, one two three, one two three, one two three, na 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 na, that is fun. One two three, if you one two three, one two three, one two three, if you if you count the number, yeah. Okay. So let's start from the beginning. So he'll give you cue to sit up really straight. Do you want it? Then you'll come in. Cha cha. Right. Um, and then just follow Dewa's cues. So he'll go T, and that means for you to stop. The beat will continue, and then at the very end, we'll go E, cha cha, bio C. Do you want it? Yeah. Do you want it? Yeah. Okay. You can pull me. Sangat pulling on you. Allah pulling on me. Deep deep part. So we get the D. It has has you see. Boom boom boom. See. Boom boom boom. See. Boom boom boom. See. Cha cha. Boom cha 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 ccha cha 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 cha
in different cycle of the gong, mm -hmm. different melody. But now we use the boom, 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 the four beat. Some realize eight beat, sixteen beat, thirty-two. Like the dear, but the pattern of chat is this. Chat, 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 in fighting, we uh, use a lot of chat loop. Cha 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 Sebetulnya kan kita yang bikin yang simple. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we create the, the simple one for for the John Muir kids actually. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so, 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 so confusing. They cannot. Because they can't couldn't hear, so yeah. we were nervous about so how to do to it. But then we like it so much. We used it all the time. time. <laughs> but because also the, this idea come from, I'm, I'm doing a project like body chat, body music. So with Kit Terry, yeah, in, in Auckland. So we have uh, my group from Bali do that and myself part of that, that uh, festival. So from there, I get the, the, the idea also. So we. So we we add that so when when we did there so it's coming to my head will be easier to do it. See everybody do it. See because as as good seal we have that already traditionally. As as good seal the traditional that let's say that you follow my mouth and they get and they do it. They, they get through that. I, yeah, I don't think Balinese kids, I mean, certainly Balinese kids don't know that pattern yeah. because yeah. it doesn't, I mean, it only exists when we teach it and then. <laughs> um, they will, but they, they would be able to pick it up quite quickly and they're really yeah. familiar with the idea of interlocking as the foundation of musical ornamentation. So I'm confident that if you were to spend a few minutes with them, they would pick it up very quickly just from having heard the interlocking in the background. Now, whether you said to them, could you guys, the 10 of you, do a catch up? That's, you wouldn't necessarily have that unless they were already trained in some other form of music, in which case they would probably come up with something. But these are actual, the, the six pattern that you learned just now are the, the actual traditional patterns that are used. So, I don't know if that answers. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.